Before the arrival of colonists, North America was home to a diverse array of indigenous tribe beach with rich, complex cultures, traditions, and languages that had developed over thousands of years. Sadly, very little was known about their day-to-day -day lives and traditions, as written records were scarce prior to colonization. This vanished world was recently illuminated by a remarkable discovery, a cache of rare photographic images exposing unknown histories of these tribes before their ancient ways were forever changed by colonists. Join us as we delve into the lives of this long-lost era. Number 15. The Lakota Oglala Woman this picture shows a Lakota Oglala woman, fully adorned in her beautifully designed native attire with a spark in her eyes that shows her pride in her heritage. The Lakota Oglala are an interesting people with a fascinating heritage. Now every culture has its own version of how the world came to be, but the Lakota people have a tale that will make your head spin. According to their beliefs, the first humans emerged from a cave. Can you imagine that? They literally popped out of a cave, and as if emerging from a cave wasn't wild enough, they were guided by the one and only white buffalo calf woman. This incredible being brought them the sacred pipe and taught them the ways of the Lakota. Then there's another fascinating aspect of their culture that is like a spiritual coming-of-age party, except without the awkward dance moves. We're talking of the vision quest, a spiritual exercise where the young go into the wilderness all by themselves in search of spiritual guidance and a deeper understanding of their purpose in life. There they spend days, sometimes even weeks, communing with nature, seeking answers to life's big questions. Although weird to admit, it'll be nice to have a link to the mysteriously awesome people. Number 14. Lucy Thompson. This is Lucy Thompson, also known as Chena Wa a remarkable Yurok author who left an indelible mark through her writings and tireless advocacy for her tribe. Born into what was known as Yurok aristocracy and married to a Euro-American man, Lucy Thompson had a unique perspective on the experiences of her people and was able to navigate the complexities of two worlds while staying true to her roots. Having seen the danger of extinction her tribe faced during the time of European-American expansion, the ill-treatment her people were meted and backed by her desire to bring the uniqueness of her people to the spotlight, she wrote her award-winning book, To the American Indian, Reminiscences of a Yurok Woman, where she shared stories and experiences of her people that were often overlooked by others, and even exposed what she called the deliberate acts of genocide meted on her tribe's people by the Europeans. If you're a history enthusiast who is passionate about the life and tapestry of ancient Americans, this book is one of your surest bets. Number 13. Kootenai Family. Say hello to this beautiful Kootenai family. The story of the Kootenai tribe is one of resilience, spirituality, and an unwavering commitment to preserving their identity. Located in what we now know as northern Idaho and northwestern Montana in the United States and southeastern British Columbia, the Kootenays are a special tribe that stood out for their distinct identity and culture unique to them, which screamed individuality. The first noticeable thing about them is their mysterious language which is unrelated to any other known tongue on earth, puzzling linguists for ages. They were exceptional nomads who had an admirable spiritual heritage where they believed in free-roaming spirits' ability to control the natural realm and even mingle with humans. And so, to keep these spirits happy, they hosted ceremonies, rituals, and dances, ensuring successful hunts and community harmony with the sun dance, a mesmerizing ceremony of renewal and unity, stealing the spotlight. Today, they are divided into bands, four in Canada, and two federally recognized bands in the United States, each with its own leader and ruling council. Number 12. Siksika Warriors. This next picture is that of Siksika Warriors, a part of the Blackfoot Confederacy who held a reputation that sent chills down the spines of their adversaries because of the skills, bravery, and mystery they displayed. Imagine them as masters of combat, who on horsebacks were formidable opponents on the battlefield. Their mastery of horseback riding, acquired after the arrival of horses in North America, made them a force to be reckoned with and a nightmare for those who dared to challenge them. But their power extended beyond mere physical prowess. The Siksika warriors knew their game. As masters of strategy, they blended physical combat with cunning tactics, employing stealth and surprise attacks to gain the upper hand, and like the shadows of the night, they struck at dawn, catching their enemies off guard. And so, 
Their enemies never knew when or where the Six Sika warriors would strike next, leaving them in a perpetual state of unease and trepidation. Their most intriguing trait was their unique communication style, where they used sign language to convey messages and stories, and even share a joke without uttering a single word, allowing them to coordinate their movements silently, amplifying their ability to strike with deadly precision. Number 11. Hashabad Mask Next on our screen is the Hashabad Mask, a representation of this Hashabad, the benevolent goddess draped in mystery and worshipped by the Navajo Nation. Hashabad, which translates to female deity or goddess, holds a special place in Navajo culture. She is revered for her ability to bestow blessings upon the natural world, ensuring the growth and abundance that sustains life itself. Picture her as a guardian of all that flourishes, a divine nurturer who ensures the prosperity of her people. But don't be fooled by her gentle persona alone. Hashabad is not confined to a singular nature. Like the ever-changing seasons, she embraces a mysterious duality that captivates the imagination. Yet beneath her serene facade lies a fierce and formidable protector capable of defending her devotees from any harm that may befall them. To honor this extraordinary goddess, the Navajo people have incorporated her into their sacred ceremonies, particularly in ceremonies dedicated to fertility and healing, like the Yebichai Night Chant Ceremony. During these rituals, men would wear these masks embodying the spirit of Hashabad as they engage in powerful medicine rites, invoking her power to bless and restore. This convergence of the human and divine realms unleashes an energy that connects the Navajo people with the divine forces that shape their existence. Hashabad's influence extends beyond the confines of specific rituals. Her revered image, which finds expression in mesmerizing sand paintings and intricate masks, serve as conduits for her blessings, urging the natural world to bestow fertility, healing, and prosperity upon those who seek her favor. While the exact details of Hashabad's workings remain shrouded in secrecy, her legacy endures through generations. Number 10. The Eclipse Dance On August 9, 1878, an awe-inspiring total solar eclipse cast its shadow across the lands of the Nez Perce people. As darkness swept over their territory, the Nimipu gathered to perform a sacred eclipse dance, one that would unexpectedly shape their destiny. While eclipses held deep spiritual meaning for the Nimipu, this dance arose from necessity and subterfuge. Just a year prior, the Nez Perce War had broken out as the tribe resisted relocation by the U.S. Army. After months of fierce fighting, Chief Joseph led 800 Nez Perce on an epic one, 300-mile retreat toward freedom. By August, the exhausted group reached the Bears Paw Mountains of Montana, just 40 miles from their goal of refuge in Canada. But the army cornered them, and fighting resumed. So, with war raging around them, the Nimipu started an elaborate eclipse dance and ceremony. To the soldiers' eyes, it seemed like a normal cultural practice. But it was a cunning distraction, allowing warriors and families to discreetly slip away. This ingenious trick, fueled by knowledge of astronomy and spirituality, enabled 200 Nez Perce to successfully escape to Canada. Though their freedom was hard won after a tremendous struggle, the eclipse dance was a symbolic triumph, and it became a legendary part of the tribe's war story for generations, celebrating the human spirit's ability to persist when all seems lost. Number 9. Nampeo Meet Nampeo the legendary Hopi artist who took a dying art form and breathed new life into it through her unmatched skill and vision. You may ask, what exactly made Nampeo's pots so special? Brace up because you're about to get your mind blown. Hopi was one tribe that was famous for their pottery skills, but after the influx of settlers, their arts lost their spice as they had started to adopt the ways of the foreigners. This creative deterioration continued until the arrival of Nampeo. As the genius that she was, with a desire to bring back to life the ingenuity of her ancestors, she started studying and mastering the secrets of their intricate patterns and elegant shapes from broken shards of the ancestral pottery, added her own creative spin to make exceptional pottery pieces, which were finished using a very unique firing process to give it a dazzling and stunning coloring, and special leaf brushes to draw striking geometry designs. All her methods, from the clay kneading to the coloring and even the smoothening, were done the ancient Hopi way whilst at the same time taking Hopi artistry to new levels. 
No wonder, even though she is no more, her creations are hot items for museums and collectors today. We're talking of pieces that cost thousands of dollars. Number 8. Papoose It's really fascinating to see the level of creativity the ancient Americans had in them. I mean, look at this beautiful portable baby carrier. You see, back in the day when moms wanted to multitask, they would strap their little ones to their backs using this mini backpack-looking cradle board. You! What's more beautiful? The fact that this cradle board was made in the most beautiful way ever imagined. We're talking creations made from wood, softened bark or animal hide, and the fancy beadwork and designs that added a touch of paparazzi. Who knew carrying a baby could be so fashionable? When in use, the baby would be tightly swaddled in blankets or furs before being placed in the cradle board for warmth and also covered for protection from the scorch of the sun or the hit of the rain because the wilderness can be pretty unpredictable. What we probably didn't know until now was that some tribes even considered the cradle board to be sacred. They would pass it down through generations, marking notches on the framework to show just how many babies it had accommodated. I wonder if they ever had competitions to see who could notch the most babies. Now, that would be a sight to see. Imagine the pride of saying, this cradle board has held five generations of our family's future troublemakers. Number seven, Hopi women. This is a picture, or should we say, a vivid depiction of part of the daily lives of the Hopi women. In Hopi culture, the ladies have long been the backbone. Going way back, Hopi women had authority over almost every aspect of their living, and part of it was how corn was grown and used by their clan. Safe to say, in their tribe, it's a woman's world. To them, corn was a gift from the Creator, where each color held symbolic meaning and ceremonial purposes. Before we continue, we need to first establish that Hopi society is matrilineal, with family lines traced through mothers. That is to say, husbands moved to live with their wives' clan instead of their patrilineal counterparts. And so practically, women called the shots, and on planting seasons, the women would make plans on the shape cultivation for that season would take, assess how much corn supplies they had, and decide what colors and types to grow each season based on needs, bless the seeds, and even pray for a bountiful harvest. After which, the hard labor in the fields will be handed to the men, though still under the supervision of the women. Well, if you think it ended there, you're mistaken. Harvesting time was a busy time for Hopi women, too. Once it's time for harvest, the men will be set to work again, this time to gather the mature corn cobs which will be sorted by the women, after which they will be either cooked in underground pits or ground into corn flour, just as seen in this picture. Number 6. The Buffalo Dance the Buffalo Dance was an important ceremonial dance for many Native American tribes, especially those living on the Great Plains. For these communities, buffalo were essential for food, clothing, tools, basically everything. So the Buffalo Dance was a way to show respect to the buffalo and connect with their spirits. Different tribes like the Lakota Sioux, Pawnee, and Mandan all had their own style of the Buffalo Dance. But the meaning behind it was the same. Through singing, drumming, and movement, they would mimic the buffalo's grazing and stampeding. This performance was like a prayer, asking the spirits to bring healthy buffalo herds for successful hunts in the future. Dancers would wear buffalo hides, heads and horns to embody the buffalo's power. As they danced, they would act out the motions of the buffalo in nature. The drum beats and chants were believed to speak directly to the spirit realm telling stories of past hunts and calling on spiritual guides for their blessings. By performing the buffalo dance, Native Americans expressed gratitude for the buffalo's sacrifice and showed deep respect for the animals. The dance honored their interconnectedness with nature and all living things. For these tribes, it was much more than just a ritual for a good hunt. It was a solemn ceremony to maintain harmony between humans, animals, and the Great Spirit. Though tribes today no longer rely on buffalo hunting like in the past, many still celebrate the buffalo dance to connect with their heritage. The dance is a powerful symbol of the enduring Native American reverence for the natural world and the ancestors who came before. Number 5. The Blackfoot Lunch If you've been a keen observer, you'll notice that a majority of ancient Native Americans were nomads. Let's explore another nomadic tribe, the Blackfoot, a people who followed buffalo herds for centuries, surviving solely on skillful hunting and gathering techniques. The Blackfoot were masters of their craft. 
Men honed their skills in making bows, arrows, and tools, while women excelled at tanning hides, crafting clothing, and adorning everything with intricate beadwork. Their society was well organized, with bands led by chiefs and councils to ensure order and unity. There are so many things to admire about them, but one that stood out was their spirit of community, which could be seen in many facets of their lives, especially during communal feasts. These feasts were prepared after successful hunts or during special ceremonies, where mouth-watering meals were enjoyed. Just as seen in this picture on such days, they would set up a fireplace in a pit they had dug in the ground, where they would cook their game and vegetables gathered by their skillful women. We can only imagine how delicious such delicacies were. Just behind them is their dwelling place called the Tippies. Despite their nomadic lifestyle, they made sure to be comfortable, so to add a touch of home, they divided the tent into different sections for sleeping, cooking, and storage. The sleeping area was furnished with soft furs and comfortable bedding to provide warmth. But the true magic of the teepee lies in its sacred designs. Passed down through generations, these designs were believed to be gifts from spirit beings. Each design held stories and meanings specific to the owner's family or lineage, making every teepee a unique testament to their heritage. So next time you sit down for a meal, remember the Blackfoot and the profound significance of breaking bread with loved ones. Number 4. Chief Ignacio Let's shift our gaze to the mighty Chief Ignacio, a formidable leader from the windswept canyons of Colorado's Uncompahgre Ute tribe whose prowess and diplomacy during a chaotic era earned him the reputation as the nation's most infamous Native American chief. As white settlers pushed westward, Chief Ignacio saw the writing on the wall. He knew his tribe couldn't defeat the United States militarily, so he chose the path of peace and reason realizing lives hung in the balance. While hot-headed leaders clamored for war, Ignacio pursued negotiation. He trekked to Washington, D.C. multiple times, seeking fair treaties for his people, leveraging his oratory skills in English and Spanish. Even when facing corrupt officials, Ignacio kept his cool and stood firmly for Ute's rights. But this doesn't mean he was no pushover. He fiercely defended his tribe's land and called out broken promises. When officials threatened forced removal to reservations, Ignacio wouldn't budge and, with unflinching boldness, announced to them that none of his people would leave the country unless they wanted to. Now this is the kind of boldness that'll weaken even the meanest oppressor. Because he refused to fight, he was called a traitor, but thanks to his good deeds, History remembers him as a tactician who used brains to retain much of their homeland when other tribes tragically lost theirs. And even after centuries have passed, his legacy lives on. Number 3. Moose Call This is a rare picture taken by Roland Reed in the early 1900s of a Native American man blowing into a carefully crafted wooden horn-like tool in his hunt for a moose. Yes, you heard that right, he's on a hunting expedition, and what he's doing is called the Moose Call. Have you heard the saying, don't take a sword to a gunfight? This is exactly why this hunter is not dressed in ways that are typical of hunters. Just as fishes are lured into a trap or fishing net with baits, so are mooses lured. But in their case, by a special technique called the moose call. The moose call can be likened to a love song mainly understood by the moose. To do that, hunters would blow into the horn, skillfully creating a tone that imitated the sultry call of a female moose. And believe it or not, this sound was enough to attract male moose, and just as if it is hypnotized, he will approach the source of the sound until he is caught. On the flip side, when the intent of the call is not for hunting, it is used to invoke the spirit of the moose in rituals or ceremonial activities in honor of its role in their lives. If you're intrigued by moose hunting or simply fascinated by ancient hunting techniques, learning the art of the moose call could be a rewarding endeavor, so why not give it a try? Number two. Princess Angeline. Meet the delectable Princess Angeline, a figure that every Seattle native or dweller owes their allegiance to. If you're in search of someone who embodies resilience and grace in the face of adversity, then look no further. Princess Angeline, or Kiki Soblu as she is known, holds great significance in Seattle's history. Born around 1820, Princess Angeline, Having witnessed firsthand the arrival of European settlers, the displacement and marginalization of her people, and the subsequent transformation of her homeland, stood as a beckon of hope. This explains why she chose to stay back in Seattle even when other natives had relocated. 
and being that she wasn't one to stay silent in the face of injustice. She fearlessly spoke up on behalf of Native Americans who were mistreated by settlers. It is even said that she saved the lives of her tribesmen when she warned them of an attack that was targeted against them. Number 1. Jicarilla Girl This wide-eyed Jicarilla girl who's gazing directly at us, wrapped in a cape, is a teenage girl who just transitioned into womanhood. The cape glitters with lunar symbols representing the cycles of the moon and of womanhood. For the Jicarilla Apache, the moon holds deep meaning, guiding the rhythms of life. This girl's cape connects her to ancestors who once stood as she does now, ready to be initiated into the mysteries of the feminine divine. For four days, she will be nurtured in ceremony by the women of her tribe. They will share sacred stories, songs, and guidance passed down through generations. This will be after the elders had led her through a series of rituals of prayer to build spiritual strength. On the D-Day, having gone through all of these procedures, she'll emerge transformed, embodying the power of the life-giving feminine spirit. Bear in mind that every detail of the feast carries meaning. The traditional foods, the rituals, and especially the girl's symbolic dress. The cape's four directions represent her place in the Apache cosmology. Sunrise and sunset symbols signal the cyclical nature of existence. Icons of nature reflect her ties to the living world. For this Jicarilla girl, the Feast of Womanhood celebrates not just her maturity, but the perpetual cycle of life embodied in changing woman. Standing beautifully in her adorned dress, she is the moon itself, waxing into fullness. The Native American cultures were fascinating. It's saddening that some were driven to extinction. It would be a delight if a day were set aside every year for each of these cultures to display their heritage to the public. Don't you think that would be amazing? Thank you for watching. For more videos like this, hit the like button and subscribe too.